First of all, welcome to Utah Valley University. Thank you for taking the time to, uh, to zoom in with us. Um, and uh, just gotta tell you, it's just such a great movie. Um, and uh, I've, been, uh, I've been kind of binging um, your short films and, and uh, Mystery Guitar Man and all the fun things. <laughs> That you guys do, and I'm well aware that you guys are joining us just a few days before Stowaway uh, launches. So I can't imagine how busy you are right now, or stressed out, or whatever. So, uh, so thank you so much for joining us. We've got a uh, looks like about 45 people here, and wow. uh, the way this works is uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and honestly, I could ask you, I could ask you about a couple hours worth of questions. So I'm going to try to keep it keep it cool and um, and then um, let them ask questions. And then if, uh, if they don't ask the questions I want, I might ask some more. Um, but again, thank you so much. Uh, it's really awesome to have both of you here because um, you're a team that writes, directs, and edits. And that's a very unique combination. Also, you, uh, you've you sort of launched your careers through YouTube and that's, uh, that's wonderful. And it's sort of, you know, here in film school, we keep saying you things like, oh, make a cool short film and get in festivals and, and, uh, and make a micro budget feature. And you guys have kind of, I don't know, maybe you've done that as well, but you've done that and you've really kind of, you know, created a brand and really kind of promoted that. And I'd, I'd love to see how, how that sort of turned into your first feature opportunity and just kind of, I mean, you know, these are film students aspiring to be uh, more or less in one way or another what, what you're doing. And I'd love to hear your, your, your uh, take on that. Yeah, you know, um, starting on YouTube was just a, a fluke, really. You know, we, um, um, you know, we had been running the channel for years and years at that time. Um, and, you know, we knew that um, the YouTube as a career wasn't uh, where we wanted to be um, long term and uh, you know wasn't sustainable for the kinds of contents that, that we were creating at the time. Uh, yeah so we, we decided to you know um, try our luck with uh, feature films because you know it's, it's easy to break into Hollywood right? Well also uh, we had uh, we had done quite a, a few uh, dipped our toes in a few times uh, with short films yeah. And uh, it gave us an opportunity to uh, practice writing in a different format than we were used to. The, I mean, the Mystery Guitar Man videos, if anybody's familiar with that, they're very musical. They're very editorial driven. They're very, um, you know, we did a lot of stop motion uh, and uh, parlaying that experience into uh, a short film. Uh, is a little bit is a little bit different. So um, and then we just kind of grew a little bit with each short film. We 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 started off really short and then built out into I think our one of our last ones was a Joe probably like close to forty minutes or so. Forty seven minutes, which uh, technically by Academy <laughs> standards is a feature film. Yeah, but we're just gonna pretend that that the Academy yeah. doesn't matter. So we felt a little bit more prepared. Um, we kind of took the steps, uh, and we're still we're still kind of taking that approach to our uh, our feature film careers. You know, starting off with something smaller like Arctic, we built up uh, a little bit bigger, little bigger step uh, with Stowaway, and then we're hoping that the next one is uh, is bigger than that. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. So <laughs> this movie. Um, so. Uh, Man, all the time I keep thinking, man, I, I sure hope that just behind, you know, outside of frame somewhere, there's like a nice lodge with a spa or a Holiday Inn or something that they're, that they're mapping out or something. Tell us a little bit about this production and what it took. As a Brazilian guy who is cold at all times, uh, I also wish that that was the case. But unfortunately, you know, when you're shooting a, a film like this, you know, you have to chase inclement weather, basically, which I uh, overall I just don't recommend uh, for any feature film, let, let alone your first. Um, but yeah, you know, we uh, were given 25 days. Um, and by the time we actually started shooting, that uh, came down to 20 because of budgetary reasons. Um, and then 19 is what we actually ended up shooting because of weather again, you know, um, uh, and yeah, you know, it, for 
the we started shooting so late into the winter season there that we needed to chase the snow. We kept chasing the snow. Um, so we were very, very far away from any kinds of hotels and Mads's agent got so mad at us because, you know, he in his contract, he's supposed to get a certain blah, 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 uh, kind of fancy the, the hotel. But, you know, we were like, OK, would, would he like to helicopter in from Reykjavik? <laughs> the only four star hotel is there. Uh, it's going to take him about six hours. Good luck. Um, you know, so no, we were basically sleeping on a glacier. Uh, but thankfully, we weren't editing uh, the film. Right, Ryan? Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, yeah, in part of our our workflow that we take from the YouTube world is uh, Joe and I kind of do everything uh, ourselves. So, um, you know, what Joe and with our short films, oftentimes, you know, we would just be shooting and then I would be cutting our turnaround is very short. Uh, so here in this case, we knew we weren't going to have additional time to come or money to come back for pickups. So I was cutting the movie together as Joe is gathering all the, the material for it as we were going. We were laying the railroad track down as the train was moving. And I'm literally like out in Iceland in like a metallic shipping container, like editing in a parka and gloves while Joe is outside in the snow um, shooting. And uh, and something that, uh, you know, we you, you always want to do, and I'm sure all of you guys are are learning right now is is to go into a shoot as prepared as possible and uh and joe is one of the most prepared uh directors i've ever had the the you know the pleasure to work with and um and he had to kind of just throw away the plan uh because we were chasing the weather so if it was sunny joe had to go shoot the what he what he could for the sunny scene and if it started snowing, we had to, and the whole crew, he had to keep everybody, usually you go out with your AD and you say, okay, these are the things that we're going to shoot today. Uh, and all the heads of department can be prepared for those things at any given time. Uh, and Joe had to, unfortunately, he had to ask them to be prepared to shoot the whole movie at, at any given moment. And, um, and we were fortunate that I was cutting as we were going so we could see, okay, do we have it? Do we at least have the clay we need for this scene to make sense? Uh, if not, we'll go back and get A, B, and C. Um, but uh, so I highly recommend it if any, if any of you are um, editing or uh, have a, a good relationship between an editor and a director, uh, highly recommend keeping them close by. Yeah, great. Um, incredible. Uh, 19 days um, and uh, Tell us, I mean, I don't, I don't imagine you had a huge budget, but you had this great international star. Um, tell us a little, and it sounds like he might not be speaking with you anymore, but, uh, but, but tell us a little bit about kind of launching this and getting it off the ground, getting the actor attached, uh, yeah. filming in Iceland, if that was uh, part of the, I mean, uh, you have a lot of Icelandic names in your, in your crew, so, was that sort of part of the production company and that choice and just kind of how that came together a little bit? Yeah, you know, so um, uh, YouTube was was really not working uh, monetarily for us. Um, so, um, you know, Ryan and I were like, okay, well, let's, um, you know, we need to give this uh, a good college try. So we wrote a film called Stowaway uh, and we submitted it to the Nickel Fellowship uh, and they, you know, made the top 50 on there. Um, and uh, we started sending it around town and everyone's like, you're insane. Absolutely not. We're not going to let you direct this as a zero time YouTuber. No, 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 no. Like a zero time director. Absolutely not. Um, so, okay. Uh, we were a little discouraged, but then we wrote another film called On Mars, which is basically what you guys saw, but on Mars. Um, and uh, as soon as we sent it to our agents, they said, uh, here is a link to uh, the trailer of a Ridley Scott film uh, called The Martian. So <laughs> throw this away, basically. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, Ryan and I uh, spent about a week just doing like a find and replace from like, he can't breathe to uh, like, oh, by the way, he's cold uh, and it's the Arctic and, you know, and changing, you know, uh, some, some of the things around from uh, a lava tube that is truly a thing that happens on Mars 
to a cave, like an icy cave. That's truly a thing that happens in the Arctic. Um, and we started, you know, doing a lot of research, speaking to all the, saying sorry to all the Martian experts, said, be like, you know, well, you guys will help us out when we get to do stowaway. And then speaking to um, Arctic survivalists. Um, and once we had that screenplay together, we were like, we need to, we need to make this happen. We have like four months left of money in the bank. Uh, we both applied for jobs at Google. Um, and uh, they, they basically said like, yeah, sure, come, come on in, come work for, for us. You know, with a YouTube experience, you could work at the YouTube spaces or whatever, maybe. Um, but we were like, if we can only, we said just a second. Um, and we started, you know, trying to go with the agencies and trying to go with everything. Uh, and we couldn't, we found some financiers that was miraculous. They said, sure, we'll give you $2 million if you can find an actor that we like. And I'm like, well, fuck. Um, so we started trying to find someone who was great. And um, it needs to be this like perfect target of like somebody who wants to do a movie like this, which is tiny and, and but yet somebody who is big enough where, you know, Europe is going to get excited about them and, and we're going to be able to pre-sell the film there um, to, to the, you know, distribution companies there. Um, and, and yeah, we, you know, we started sending it around, like maybe Robert Pattinson or something like that. Um, you know, he's just done something called high or he's doing something called high life. Uh, maybe he will want to do something like this. Uh, uh, but yeah, you know, it happens that somebody who we knew knew somebody who knew somebody who knew Mads Mikkelsen. Um, and they were like, I, I said, it doesn't matter. Like this, you know, Mads Mikkelsen is just going to say no, but go ahead, send it to him. Uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's how I got started. And basically uh, on a Wednesday, they said, hey, Mads wants to talk to you tomorrow. Uh, and then we got on a Skype call. Uh, for three hours, we started talking and talking and talking about the film. Uh, and he's just smoking a cigarette the entire time, of course. He's, um, so it's a real experience, you know, just getting on a Skype call uh, with Mads Mikkelsen. I suppose not now after the pandemic. Um, and, and yeah, you know, it's, it was supposed to be a 20 minute phone call, but three hours later, um, I come out and I tell Ryan, I think, I think we got him, you know? And then that Friday they said, can you fly to Iceland tomorrow? To so start, you guys, gotta, you guys gotta start shooting the film. Go, 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 go. Wow. Yeah, so Joe and I had to take off and, and go to Iceland and start getting in like, okay, we got to find a helicopter, we got to find a plane. And, uh, you know, we, we were the ones on the phone calling helicopter and plane distributors and graveyards and trying to try trying to find parts and pieces for our, to help our production design. Uh, figure out um, figure out what our budget was going to be and um, just figure out how to how to make it work um, and uh, yeah we, we we hit the ground running and started scouting locations and uh, just moving so quickly from the second he hung up the phone with Mads to getting off a plane in Iceland and somehow also we lost five days of shooting while we were like at the airport before we left they said you have 25 days and when we landed in iceland they said you have 20 days <laughs> it's wow. the ever-flowing budget of the uh, of the indie world you know yeah, somebody, uh, somebody oh yeah no, we forgot to budget in uh this one other thing or we thought that we had the distributor um or you know uh, this and this and that can you guys shoot it in 20 days can you guys shoot it in five days how about just like 90 minutes just get it all done like in real time you know, is that possible <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like <clears throat> some people lose luggage. You guys lose days on your flights. <laughs> we also that's lost luggage on the way there, but that's a whole <laughs> you also do that. Okay. <laughs> well, wonderful. I mean, it's such a great movie. Uh, I'm sure we're going to hear some great uh, questions from this group here, um, uh, guys. If you have questions for these gentlemen, please put your name in the chat, and I will uh, call on you. Um, please say your you know, like your name and uh, maybe a little bit like what year you are in school or whatnot. Uh, so they get a sense of who you are. And uh, we're going to start with Roan Oberg, a good uh, Scandinavian name to start things off with. 
Ron, are you here? Hi, you guys. Um, this is exciting for me because I used to watch Mystery Guitar Man back in the early days of YouTube. So I'm a, I'm a big fan. And I love the movie, too. Uh, and my question is um, about the music, because the movie has such a powerful score. It's super emotional. But even when the score isn't there and we mostly get silence, it's still really powerful, too. So my question is, what factors both directorial and editorial lead to deciding when to use music and when to use silence? Hmm. Uh, good question. Uh, yeah, you know, we both Ryan and I um, have a musical background. Um, I'll give you guys, uh, you know, I'll put a, a link in the chat to Ryan's uh, early music. Not totally uh, unnecessary. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, we, uh, uh, Ryan, as he, once we finished the cut, you know, and, and it was very, very, very um, early uh, because Ryan had been cutting on on set, basically the set that we didn't have. Uh, you know, it, it, we wanted to make this film as as close to done as possible. Like if it leaked at the very end of it, we would be devastated, but we would be happy enough that it looked good enough so so ryan and i both came from a bfx background and had musical background and, and had done everything ourselves so we we're like let's do it let's do everything ourselves um so i started working on a temp score while we were trying to find a composer uh and then ryan started working uh on vfx uh just like temp vfx uh just you know like get a polar bear national geographic footage we'll rotoscope a polar bear out of that and then plop them into our film um, and, and make that work or, or, you know, remove footprints from the snow. It's just, you know, removing fans, removing things like that, um, just so it really feels desolate. Right? And I did a lot of uh, the sound design too. So once we had that, um, which was relatively early, uh, we were able to send that around to everyone in town here. And, and everyone was like, holy crap, this is a, this is a great movie. We can, we can get some, some amazing work here. Um, and the, the story of, of how we got our composer is pretty amazing. Uh, there, a friend of ours came to town and my wife's name is Sarah, my name is Joe. And they were like, you know what? Our other friends who, the only other people who we know here, it's a couple named Joe and Sarah. So you should go, we should all just go to dinner together. It'd be hilarious. Um, so we all <laughs> go to dinner <laughs> and, uh, you know, none of the news of Arctic has come out yet. And uh, I, I'm talking to the other Joe and I'm like, hey, so what, what do you do? He's like a composer. I'm like, oh, cool. What do you do? I'm a, I'm a director. Okay, cool. Um, what did you direct? I'm like, I have this movie called Arctic. I'm, and he's like, oh, I, I've, I've, seen, I, 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 I've seen it. I'm like, you haven't. It's not even announced. It, it's no, uh, you, you must have seen something else. There's another movie out there that you're thinking of. Uh, he's like, no, it's with Mads Mikkelsen. I'm like, yes. It's like, I'm a composer, like it was sent to me. I, I'm, this is like super awkward, but like, I really want to do your film. Uh, and so the whole dinner, we just ignored all, everyone else. And we just talked about the film the entire time. He's like, oh, what about this moment? What about that moment? Uh, and uh, yeah, and then he was in, and then Ryan and I uh, went in there and started talking about the music uh, and talking about the spotting basically and figuring out where the music was gonna be. And Ryan can go into that. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, we had to hire him because uh, fate was obviously tempting us with, with this situation. Um, but uh, uh, Joseph Trapneze, who's our, our composer, he had, uh, I, we had initially put temp in, you know, not wall to wall, but we had, we had placed quite a bit of temp in there. And that's always a, a difficult thing for um, a, a composer to, uh, to overcome. Uh, so what we did was we gave him a version with our temp music and we gave him a version without the temp music. And we said, watch whichever one you want. If there's ever a spot where you're stuck, uh, you can always reference what we, what we have here. And, um, and uh, Joseph had some really great instincts and there were some spots where we had music that his, he, it's, it's a, going against his job, but he's saying, you know what, that opening scene where he's digging, like, I don't think you need it. Like, I think you just let it ride on, on the shot and you just let it play out. Uh, so we, we listened to him and we were very fortunate to have um, a great sound design team and a great mixer. So um, to, to answer your question a little bit more in the technical sense too, um, in the sound mix, Trapanese had given us 
some stuff that he was like, just don't use it. Like here, here is, here is the cue. It's for this spot, but don't use it. And we still have the opportunity in the mix for Joe, uh, for Joe Penna to be talking to our mixer and say, Hey, can we try this without, and can you, you know, goose the atmospheres a little bit. And we then got to have a, a, a little bit more of a, um, a handle on it and a, and a, and a, a hand in the, um, the soundtrack and the, and the um, sound design, even after the fact, uh, after everything was designed. And sometimes we'd be in the mix and we would need, oh, you know what, if we're not gonna have music here, we, the, it's still a little empty and our sound designer would be there with us and they'd cook something up and then, uh, and then pop it in. And we just had a, we had a really great team. It was really super collaborative and um, ultimately, that became so influential to me as an editor. It became so clear to me that, oh, you know what, shit, now that the music's there or now that this sound is playing out this way, I wish I held that shot a little bit longer right. or I wish I cut this a little bit shorter um, or I cut on this downbeat. Uh, so now uh, what we did on Stowaway was I tried to in inv invite the sound designer, invite the composer into the process while we were shooting. Um, you know, get those guys involved. Um, so, cause that's influencing the cut and we have the technology now to not necessarily have to lock the edit and then send it off. And then now you're, you're married to the cut the way that it is. Bring those departments that influence the rhythm, that influence the feel of a moment, bring them in as early as possible. Uh, even, you know, our, our composer was writing uh, just sketches to the script you know, w w after conversation with Joe about tone. Um, so uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we don't have the limitations that they used to have uh, because we can, you know, transfer files pretty easily or, you know, have a, 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 a you know, Zoom like this. So um, yeah, uh, sound and, and picture were very fluid. Awesome, thank you guys so much. I uh, really love the movie and I'm really excited to see Stowaway. Thank you. Thanks for watching for such a long time. All right, let's go to Wes Cyphers. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, uh, great film, you guys. Y'all did a great work. Um, I guess uh, my question, it was kind of already answered by Dwayne. Um, just, I, I wanted to ask about the production, but it seems like you guys had a blast, but also faced a lot of issues. Um, but sorry, my dogs are climbing all over me. Um, but I, I guess my question is more of an editing uh, perspective. Um, I'm a senior and I'm an editor. Mm -hmm. And so basically, I guess it's kind of a, a writing question also, because you have three actors, two of which have very little lines um, and basically no dialogue throughout. So what was kind of your process of um, writing and editing something like this where there's next little to no dialogue and you're, you're conveying a story entirely through images? What Could you kind of walk us through what that was like? Talk about the writing side of it. Yeah, um, you know, the first version of the screenplay that we sent out was um, 47 pages long. Um, and uh, you guys know that uh, most of Hollywood believes in the ardent and fast and absolutely always true rule that one page of script equals one page of movie, which is absolutely just not true. Uh, <laughs> ever like uh, we, we actually we did a the math there was only one page in anything that we've ever produced that was exactly one minute but anyway um, so uh, you know it was tough to convince people that this was a feature film uh, so Ryan and I were like oh, well we need to expand this into somewhat like feature length so we started getting fancy with it. We started putting a lot of uh, white space 
and you know uh, putting like haikus into the screenplay and uh you know uh, we tweeted out or read it out or something like that one of the uh one of the pages that start with a very long sentence and then they get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and then ends with just one word until dot 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 and then next page and we started getting fancy about like you know comic books get to put like the most exciting thing on the bottom right panel <laughs> um every time so like let's let's do that you know um we we put like the most exciting thing at the very bottom of the page so that people have to turn the page um and that kind of thing uh where you know we just expanded it into something that seemed more like a feature film um and then yeah we just threw it all away when um it was time to shoot and then ryan you can talk about uh, <laughs> trying to edit something that was like you know, somewhat what, like uh, the screenplay that we had written. Well, I, I think it, it also, I mean, before we get into editorial, I mean, also the, the plan, you know, the plan for the for the shoot. Um, uh, don't sell yourself short on like, you know, we knew, we knew on the page because we wrote it, uh, we knew how long roughly some things would take. And, uh, you know, Joe had shot the movie in a way where um, we always try to create little mysteries. Uh, little mysteries are things that we kind of we learned a lot about by watching uh, the red the red turtle. Um, it's a great, almost entirely silent uh, animated film, uh, and that's a great study for editorial and it's a great study for silent storytelling. Um, it's a very interesting movie, but uh, basically uh, what we learned is that you can you can do a lot with your shot selection. Uh, so Joe would would shoot a, a, a sequence where it can be an evolving shot that might just be uh, uh, on the on the page. Um, you know, Overgard uh, looks for his boots or whatever. I don't remember exactly what it would be, and that's an evolving shot that now we don't see where what he's looking for. We try to follow his eyes, and then we uh, now the audience is leaned in wondering what he's looking for or looking at and then you give the the satisfaction and the payoff of eventually what what the answer is to that question so we tried to lay in those little mysteries throughout the film at the beginning you know there he's cleaning off the rocks and we don't really know what those rocks are until he's buried someone else and he piles up the rocks again so that answers the question and it doesn't answer it immediately there are several pages several scenes between the two uh, and then from an editorial standpoint, cutting that together, uh, it's again, just about feeling rhythm and, and feeling the, uh, either the natural urge to want to see what Overguard sees, or, um, you know, you don't, it's, it's a balancing act because you don't want to overstay your welcome in, uh, in a particular moment. And, uh, I mean, we, we were just discussing, uh, today and yesterday. Uh, about some some scenes that we had to cut as well because we we actually shot the movie was I think two hours and 15 minutes when we were done um, and uh, there were some scenes that we really liked there was a whole sequence where the picture had got her picture of her family had gotten lost and he went back and looked for it and it interrupted the flow of the movie as a whole um, so even though as a sequence in itself it worked we had to be looking at the film globally. Uh, and that was a little story and a little mystery that, um, that interrupted the flow and, and therefore became a you know, deleted scene. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, too, um, that was uh, you know, um, the night before he forgets the picture. Um, you know, he's cranking his little device and just for a second it flashes green and then red, 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 red again. And it's one of Matt's best performance in, in the film um in my opinion where he runs out and he's looking out like the, the crazed man like screaming out like where are you where are you uh and he's so devastated by this uh and then we got it uh, because it was too too in the way uh and we you know ryan and i like we might have looked for, for like days and days and days like where do we put this where else can we put this man like, it's such a good performance um but you know there wasn't anywhere in the film where it belonged um so yeah you know sometimes it's uh it's about killing your darlings as um uh, the horrible saying goes yeah and i i really enjoyed one of those uh like beautiful mysteries that you're talking about where 
uh, he's in the helicopter and you see him kind of look and you can already kind of tell that it's like a picture or something of the pilots. But then we don't actually see the picture until a little bit later. He's, he's holding it. And, you know, normally the thing is to cut over the shoulder looking down, but that just never happens. And so I think that was just those, all those little moments put together just makes this film like just an amazing piece of art. So thanks for sharing it with us. And thank you for hanging out with us tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right, cool. We got Austin Perez. Austin, you with us still? Unmuting. Austin? No. Okay. Let's skip Austin. Maybe he pops back in. Um, oh, he says, yeah, he's dealing with some technical issues. Let's, let's skip really quick to Spencer Elwood. Hey, I'm Spencer. I'm on the directing track here. <laughs> And so I was, I was curious, like watching the movie, it's so good and it's such like a cool character piece, a very original character piece. But I was thinking a lot about how y'all have a second movie coming out. And I think for a lot of college students, particularly like the junior senior level, which is where I'm at, there's always that question of like, what's next? So how do y'all handle like the momentum of this? Like, what did you do when this movie came out and people saw it and like, how did you take this and go, look, we can do this, we can make stuff. Like, what was your strategy of trying to get the next thing made? Yeah, um, you know, we, we had the good fortune to already have had a uh, script written, you know, um, and as soon as Arctic was, um, was in, in the way of getting done, our foreign uh, distributor said, you know, brought us in for a meeting. They were like, guys, we just watched a rough cut. Holy moly. Um, that's not what they said, they, they swore. Uh, but they were like, uh, what else do you guys have? You know, like, let's, we, we can make this, we'll put a little bit more extra money into this. We'll get like some Academy Award winners to like do the sound design for you and things like that. Um, but like, what else do you have? And we're like, well, you know, dust it off, stow away what do you guys think of this, right? They're like, okay, let's, uh, let's get that going. Uh, and we started thinking about uh, who would be the best actors for that um, and you know, where we could shoot that uh, because the way that we shot um, Arctic was by utilizing a lot of uh, tax incentives in Iceland. Iceland said, hey, if you guys shoot here and you hire a bunch of Icelandic people, hence all the Icelandic names, um, you, know, you will give you 25% of all the money that you spend here back to your production. Um, to your financiers, basically. Um, and, you know, we were starting to search for something similar. Um, and then we had the good fortune of getting into the Cannes Film Festival, which, oh my God, was, was an amazing um, feat for us. You know, we, 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 you always submit, it's a $50 fee, you know, like it's, it's worth it to just, to just, you know, try to get lucky. Uh, and we did, uh, we got into the official selection uh, so once we knew that, um, Ryan and I said, let's go to Cannes and, you know, our film is playing the first two days. Let's stay the whole time and, you know, let's walk the streets with the tuxedos that they're going to force us to buy and be like, is anybody want to away? You know, with signs saying like next movie here, uh, we just sold, we just sold one to somebody we think. Um, so yeah, um, off we go to the Cannes Film Festival, um, and you know we don't have an actor attached or anything, uh, and that was uh, absolutely didn't work at all um, at the Cannes Film Festival. So we just started sending it around to actors, um, and the very first one we sent to was Anna Kendrick, um, and she read it and was interested and signed on. Yeah, I think uh, to just to add to what Joe was saying too is. Um, that you're absolutely right. Like every every single time we've we've ever done anything, uh, anything that was of any significance, um, people always say, "Well, what what else do you have?" Um, because just like when you're watching Netflix now, you're like, "Well, oh man, I, I want to see the next episode." Or what else have these people done? Um, what else is that person in? Um, so that is always 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 the first question. So uh, even back in the YouTube days, Joe and I would always tell people when they ask us about you know how to how to be successful it's just keep keep doing it 
keep writing it, keep working with writers and, and, and finding projects that you want to produce so that you have plenty of things. Even right now at this stage in our careers, um, we constantly have this ebb and flow of projects that come into us or that we're putting out into the world to try to get off the ground um, because it's such, the, the statistics are so terrible. Like the chances are, are so um, slim to get something made. Um, that you have to have uh, uh, projects in, in different stages so that once something goes, it's like, okay, well, we, we've still got this, we've still got that. Um, and, and, a, and a piece of advice that, um, that I got from uh, Jim Haygood, who was the editor of Fight Club, um, he told me this is critical for me and Joe to be able to have a uh, uh, a rough cut that we could send around to people so we could even create a little bit of buzz and get, we got into can with the rough cut, not even with the finished version yet because we, we hadn't um, gotten into scoring and, and sound design yet. Um, and he said, leave nothing to anyone's imagination. So in the edit, if a doorbell is supposed to ring, don't put a title up that says doorbell rings because you're an editor and you don't do sound design find a shitty doorbell sound effect and put it in, just put something in, it doesn't matter. And we took that very literally and we went through and we did VFX so that people don't see craft services in the background and footprints all over the place because it breaks the illusion of the film. And I think that contributed quite a bit to, uh, to getting Academy Award winners uh, interested in doing the sound design and, and sound mix, to getting people like Joe Trapanese interested in doing uh, the music and, and then to getting us into can, uh, which gave us a level of street cred that had um, pretty high level people asking us, what, what do you have, what do you have next? Uh, and it makes people like the, the guys at XYZ confident in being uh, able to ask us, what's the other script that you have? Let's find an actor to do it. Even though we, we, we weren't successful you know, packaging it at can, it didn't take too much long after that in order to uh, to get Stowaway moving. Awesome. Cool. Uh, uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, Spencer, for that question. Austin, we're going to go back to you. All righty. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. Yeah, my camera's having issues, unfortunately. So, so I'm so sorry about that. Imagine um, an incredibly handsome guy with very long hair. <laughs> um, yeah. So, my question was actually going to be closer towards like, uh like i guess like around 2010 back when you guys were still heavily doing youtube um i know you guys had done a lot of collaboration stuff and i would imagine probably some commercial work here and there at what point did you guys kind of figure aside from the monet hole like monetizing videos on youtube uh at what point did you guys kind of feel like we need to start pushing filmmaking more and doing stuff like that rather than and kind of like stray away from YouTube. At what point did you guys kind of feel like you're going to basically, did you ever have a seize the moment kind of thing? It was uh, June 27th, uh, 2014. Um, that's absolutely true. Uh, YouTube uh, switched their uh, algorithms basically overnight and uh, our view count uh, more than more than halved, uh, it was like 60% down basically overnight uh, because of the way that YouTube was working with, uh, uh, you know, promoting longer videos, keeping people on uh, and, you know, showing you ads in the middle of the videos as opposed to our like three minute ditties um, as Blue Travelers likes to say. Uh, you know, we knew right then and there that we needed to figure out a way to become a production company. Um, and yeah, you know, the commercial stuff was a, a way to like make a lot of money quick um, to so that we can have a lot of time um, to figure out how to make a movie, which is a lot harder. Um, once you make one movie, you get like a Ryan calls it like the boulder that's rolling, you know, like you get the boulder rolling with one movie. And if that m movie makes money, that's all they care about. They, they don't care about Rotten Tomatoes. They don't care about anything else. Uh, it's just like, OK, that movie made money check mark he gets to make another one uh then that movie makes money check mark you know uh, that explains a lot of directors that have had long careers on ho in hollywood um and actors perhaps uh but you know it's it was a matter of trying to buy 
runway for us to take off in the uh, in the feature film world. And, and yeah, those commercials, the you know McDonald's commercials, the uh, Sony commercials, um, uh, Coke and McDonald's uh, together, like all that kind of stuff. Uh, that was that was great, uh, but that was just a way to one learn how to do production because in commercials. You know, you're, you're walking outside and they have so much money. I remember one time we were uh, in a studio, like fancy, fancy studio at McDonald's. And, you know, I walked outside. I said, hmm, I wish this sidewalk walk were just like a foot or two longer. Shrugged and I went back inside. The next day I come in and the sidewalk, they're like building a, you know, a wooden sidewalk that looks exactly like the rest of the sidewalk and like blending it in. And I was like, oh, okay, great wonderful uh so like that kind of like pie in the sky you get to do whatever the heck you want versus in arctic which is more the youtube approach which is like hey what do we ex exactly need to make this two million dollar movie arctic look like a 10 million dollar because everyone was telling us this is a 10 to 15 million dollar movie you cannot do this for two one or two which is what we were looking at yeah. Also, um, you know, at at the point where we were making the making the transition, uh, I, I hope that everybody in this in this Zoom doesn't ever have to end up in the position that Joe and I were in, um, because we had to we had to go all in. Uh, and I remember we wrote a little contract uh, to each other uh, because we said, okay, well, we can try. Uh, we can try to go like it's very it, it would have been pretty easy for us to get a job in the advertising world um we had connections there uh and we we actually had uh, resumes and interviews done and, and then we just had a, a real like sit down look at yourself in the mirror are we doing this like Thelma and Louise let's drive off the cliff uh together and we just said okay yeah we're we're gonna commit and this is how much like we, for years, we have not thought about money in terms of how much money do we have in the bank? We think about it in terms of how much runway do we have before the tank is on, on E and we have to quit. Um, and uh, we had a line there and said we were gonna commit to just going for it. Uh, and we went for it with, with Arctic and it was an all in move. Um, we didn't know if any jobs were gonna be waiting for us when we were done, if it failed, if we were even gonna finish the movie, if anyone was gonna pick it up. Uh, but YouTube was no longer sustainable for us to be making a living. So we kind of had to just, you know, close our eyes and <laughs> jump off a cliff together. And um, thankfully it, it worked out. Awesome. I, I appreciate it. And I loved Arctic as well. And I thought it was it, visually, it looked great. I'm a cinematographer, so it really appealed to me. Thank you. We shot it without lights at all. There, there was one single light in the whole movie. Um, and it was the one day that we couldn't shoot anywhere. So we went into a garage uh, and we shot the inside of the bag. Uh, yeah, that's flashlight. It, that doesn't count. Nah, it was a it was a fancy flashlight. It was like a a, a, a movie flashlight. <laughs> All right, we have Saul Castillo. Uh, hi. Um, so first off, uh, Joe Ryan. Um, I thought that you guys did a really good job with the film. Um, and I guess my question would be, um. So you guys ended up filming this for about 19 days, is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, how did you guys uh, manage to film uh, for 19 days straight, you know, in the, those cold snowy mountains? How did you manage that? We almost didn't. Um, we had the saddest wrap party that I've ever seen. What? <laughs> been to it was just everyone was so tired and it's like what are we doing here We're, i'm not drinking right now um you know and it was it was just it, you know the majority of us were like just red and red and because of the goggles like fine uh, around here poor mats was just bright red and thin as a rake because you know instead of eating lunch he would just go and and curl bundle up and we we're all just bundle up and, and we were all awful it, it was so sad um 
I am, again, I'm cold at all times. Um, and, you know, I, I think I just broke. I think Ryan knows exactly when I, I broke. Um, I do. I do. I know the moment. Joe, Joe as a Brazilian, I'm, I'm from Boston, so I'm very used to the cold. Uh, I loved it. I had a great time uh, shooting. Um, but Joe, at one point, I've never been more proud of him because uh, I had bought him some like uh, some pe pencils and paper that would work in snow and rain. And he was taking some notes and he had these mittens on and we were all just soaked and it was freezing. And he just said he couldn't really write with the mittens on and he just took the mittens off and just beasted it in the cold and was just writing uh, barehanded and uh, said forget it to his uh, battery heated shirt that he had. And I'm sorry, I'm, blast I'm putting you on blast right now, Joe. Yeah, hey, um, technology is there. I want to take it. But uh, but yeah, I mean, we all kind of had to just struggle and adapt, and it was long days. Uh, editorial on on the day was like Joe and I would finish shooting a fourteen hour day, and continue the edit so that we could know what we needed for the next day. And Tommy, our cinematographer, would show up uh, at the uh, uh, would show up to pick us up, and we would talk about the plan for that day, or he would come over that night while I was editing and him and Joe would be talking. And it was just a 24 hour, uh, we just worked 24 hours a day for the entire shoot. And then, uh, you know, came back to sunny LA and stayed inside my apartment and kept, <laughs> kept working. We, all of us broke at certain points. As long as we weren't all broken at the same time, we would all kind of look around and be like, okay, everyone's, everyone's healthy. I'm breaking now uh, at different parts of the shoot. You know, I remember there was one time where my cinematographer, we were trying to figure out, it, it's like, there's no snow anywhere. Like we, we scouted this place and it's just beautiful, beautiful snow everywhere. We get there to shoot on the day and it's all melted and it's beautiful flowers. And we're like, why flowers? Wow, if it were anything else, but flowers, how? Uh, we need one flower in the whole movie, but okay, fine. Uh, there was one little tiny hill that still had a bit of snow and my cinematographer and I were like, okay, uh, he goes, Let, let's shoot from here. I'm like, that's the wrong side of the line, the, the 180. He's like, oh, okay, um, uh, what, what about from here? I'm like, Tommy, you're still on the wrong side of the line. He's like, oh, oh, oh I see what you mean. Uh, okay, so how about from here? And I'm like, so I put my foot down and I just drag a, a line across the snow. And I'm like, Tommy, you cannot go on that side. Where are you going to shoot from? He's like, we can't. Okay, uh, yeah. So we uh, ended up not being able to shoot that particular thing that one day. But like to to have a cinematographer, professional cinematographer who's been shooting as long as I've been alive, like not remember the most basic cinematographical rule. It, it was you know clearly, and he's Icelandic, so you know, we all knew that it was it was you know a huge toll for us. Um, but it was, it, it shows in the film, you know, if you're gonna make a film where the protagonist is so affected by inclement weather, then you're gonna have to be in a place that has inclement weather. You know, you're gonna have to deal with, you know, there's, there's a blizzard and then almost immediately it, it stops and the sun comes out and we're like, oh God, okay, so uh, turn this way. Uh, hey, you guys, you know, put a little thing on on Mads. Uh, you know, it's it's gonna be a little bit later in the film. Uh, Mads, you're, you're way sadder than, than you are right now. Okay, go. Um, and yeah, as a director, you have to be ready for that. You know, th there was one day where we were so behind. We were so, we were like six hours behind and on a set that's just death you know, like six hours behind. And Ryan had just run up to me with like a, a post-it note uh, with like, we're missing like eight shots, dude, from the last scene. What were you thinking? Here's, you're gonna have to pick these up today. And I'm like, oh God. So not only do we have to shoot like six hours worth of stuff, plus these eight shots. And then my, uh, my wonderful uh, costume designer comes up to me and goes, hey, um, for the handkerchief that he has, would you like the red one or uh, the black one? And I'm like, I don't think there's anything in the world that I could care less about than the <laughs> color of his handkerchief right now. But I think the black one would look a would look a little bit better because uh, you know it'll contrast well with the with his red. So you know, uh, directorially speaking, 
you got to be ready for those days where it's just like nothing's working and what have I done? Um, what huge mistakes have I made in, in pre-production? Oh my God, so many of those in still way. And what are we going to do about a live polar bear? We'll figure that out later, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, so, something just to, to add to that too is, um, you know, whether you're a, a director or you're in post, uh, sometimes you do get squeezed and, and, and Joe got squeezed on a few days where he could, did not have the time to shoot coverage uh, for anything. Uh, we just, they just needed to capture something that covered the page that they were out there shooting. And um, th thankfully, I, you know, he gave me a lot of uh, freedom and trust uh, to, to try some stuff in the edit. And I've, the, the, basically like the last third of the film, there's a, there's a moment where uh, uh, Mads is pushing uh, the sled up the hill and he can't get it up the hill and he stops and he's, and we're bouncing back and forth right. between that sequence, him sitting with his head, like looking up and it, none of what that was how it was written. It was all written in a very linear way. Uh, he tries to do this, he's stuck, he's sitting on the ground, then he hears the helicopter. Um, and, or he dumps all the stuff out and then he hears the helicopter. And um, because we just didn't have much coverage, I only had like one shot of each of those scenes. So I ended up cutting it together in a way where it was like this non-linear uh, expression of what was going on in his head. Um, and it worked way better than what we had on the page. Even if Joe had gotten coverage, I'm so glad that it ended up uh, working out the way that it did because it pushed me as an editor uh, and there were other solutions and uh, problems and solutions that Joe and I have have worked out together, whether it be on Arctic or Stowaway, where, um, you know, maybe what sh was shot didn't work or didn't work for the way the story was playing out. And we, we just have to adapt uh, in the edit. Brian, you also you also mirrored yes. that because you had a similar sequence earlier in the film. Mm -hmm. Did you set that up afterwards to, to kind of to kind of pay it off, because there was a similar sort of uh, um, sort of cutaway moment like that, sort of a nonlinear right, moment. I think the uh, the beginning of the film where yeah. we're ramping up. Uh, that what definitely was one of those happy things that when people say, "Did you do that on purpose?" Most of the time we say, "Yeah, of course." Uh, no, that was one of those things that sometimes on the timeline it just works out and and works. Um, but I will totally take credit for that in the future. <laughs> Good, you should. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thank you, Saul. We have Anna, uh, Anna Wilkinson. And again, if anyone has questions, you should put your name in chat. We do have uh, currently, how are you guys holding up? You okay? Okay. We have Anna, Anna Wilkinson. Hello. So first off, amazing film. I mean, and very impressive for your first movie, I, I gotta say. And Especially with me thinking about going into video editing, I am blown away with what you guys have come up with. So my question is that I've done some research and for your for your new movie coming out in about next week, um, I've somehow uh, researched that you guys had to split distribution, I guess. So, so Netflix in the other territories and Amazon in Canada, so. I'm curious of what, how that came up. Yeah, that's a, that's a COVID special. Um, you know, we, it, that film was, uh, was meant to be Sony. Uh, it was done in a very similar way to Arctic. You know, you, you, you go to a bunch of different countries and you say, hey, Germany and France, uh, you know, we have uh, Anna Kendrick and Tony Collette and this kid from Cannes once, um, you know, Oh, look, we just added Daniel the Kim. Would you guys like to buy the movie now? Or do you want to buy the movie for like 200 times more money later? Um, you know, and you do that to enough countries. Okay, not 200 times. Uh, but, you know, you do that to enough countries where you, they, they want to buy it now. You know, you're, you got, you've got like a pay TV thing or, you, you know, you're uh, an airline or something like that. Uh, or you just Fox TV and they're like, oh, yeah, we want to play this movie on Fox eventually. We'll just buy it now um, and we'll wait for you guys to finish it, right? Um, and then Sony had purchased the movie, like pretty much the, the whole world, and they were going to put it into theaters. We're going to figure it out, you know, that which way is it like a Sony movie? Is it a Screen Gems? Is it 
TriStar, they have so many studios. I don't even understand it. And we had to deal with them. So I, I don't know. Um, so like we were going to figure out exactly the like which music plays before um, the film. And then the pandemic hit and Sony was like in every studio, basically, it was like, we got to dump these movies. Uh, and Netflix and who Amazon were making so much money hand over fist that they just had all this money to buy movies away from these distributors. So Netflix and Amazon started bidding on Stowaway. Netflix took the vast majority of the world. Uh, some of these territories held on to Stowaway, like uh, like uh, Canada was one of them, but then they ended up going to Amazon. Um, there are a couple of places like uh, Germany, um, because of the deal that we had over there, they paid for half of our film, uh, you know, basically it, it must go into theaters. Uh, so Germany's in, and, and there are a couple countries in the whole world that it will go to theaters, um, but overall, because of the pandemic, um, it ended up on Netflix, which hey, to me is, is great. You know, with Arctic, um, I couldn't show it to half my family because Disney had bought it down in Brazil, where I'm from. And uh, Disney cares more, uh, you know, they, they were releasing some some like superhero thing, uh, end game thing uh, that I don't know, I haven't seen it yet. Um, they were more worried about that than Arctic. Uh. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. I, yeah, that totally answered my question. Yeah, so again, amazing job. And I'm looking forward for the next movie. Andrick, Anna Kendrick's one of my favorite actresses. So I send my love to her. All right, right, we'll do. Um, okay, we got two more questions for you. Is that all right? Okay, Tyler McKinnon. We're gonna go with Tyler and then we'll do Tanner after that. Go for it, Tyler. Hey, Joe and Ryan. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. This is awesome. I always enjoy getting to talk with uh, real filmmakers and, and it's, it's really a treat. Um, my question is uh, for, you know, your first feature and just in general, I was wondering if you could talk about the process of directing and working with Mads. Um, I imagine it would be this double-sided coin of um, just an honor mixed with being maybe a little um, apprehensive. I'm, I'm just wondering what the process was like. Yeah, you know, um, when you're working with somebody like Mads, um, uh, you know, you, you, of course you, you go and you watch all the movies you've missed. Um, and when he doesn't have a bad movie, um, when he is sometimes the only good part of a movie that I watched, uh, then you start wondering like, how does this work working with this guy? You know, like, do you just kind of like set up the camera and, you know, you, you press the little red button, you check to make sure it's recording and say, I don't know, like action, I guess. You do your thing. He must not listen to bad directors sometimes. Like, does he just do his own thing? Um, but quickly I realized, and I wish I had realized it way earlier, uh, that as a director, uh, it, it, you know, you're being hired for your taste and everyone's got taste. You know, my six-year-old kid, he, he's got taste. He likes certain things and he doesn't like other things. And it is your job to, to get your ideas, your the people uh, to, to do your ideas. You know, of course, craft is a huge part of directing and you got to know your craft. Uh, but really, you're there for your taste. And there were a lot of people who had been doing their jobs a lot longer than, but again, I have been alive sometimes. A lot of people with gray hair uh, who are on the production who know way more about a certain thing. Uh, but when they come up to you and say, look, it, this, this prop can either be uh, this super high tech, fancy beep, 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 beep kind of thing, or it just be a little shitty crank. Uh, which one do you want? I'm like, I want the shitty crank. I don't want it to make noise sometimes, you know, so that people understand uh, he's cranking and cranking and cranking, but not too annoying of a noise. It can't be like, because eh, 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 that, that's get too annoying. Uh, like, and you can just get more and more granular into it. And, you know, working with Mads, it's, it's kind of the same way. And you just kind of start to, it's, it's a dance. You know, you start realizing, uh, again, we don't have much time. So we're rehearsing while they're setting up the camera. He's just not leaving set. And majority of the time you say, thank you so much. You go back to your trailer and go back to, you know, 
uh, you TikTok or whatever you were doing. Okay, hey, we're ready for you. Uh, and then 10 minutes later, they waltz into set. It's like, all right, so here's what we're, we didn't have time for that. You know, he's in every single frame. So we're rehearsing the next shot as they're setting up, right? And Mads is the kind of person who's like, I started realizing that I could work with him in a completely different way. You know, usually you don't give people line readings, but he was asking for them. He was saying like, oh, uh, um, how do you want me to say this? I'm like, I, 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 oof, I want you to say it uh, uh, with a, and you're not supposed to give people like emotions. I don't want you angry. I, I want you to say it angrier, you know, because they'll just say like, and, and that doesn't work. And it, it just becomes a matter of like talking around what you're trying to get. But with Mads, I, I was like, he was like, just, just say how you want me to say it. And I would, I would just say it. He's like, okay, I'll do that. And then he would do what I did, but like better because he's mad. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, but like in the vector that I gave him, you know? So yeah. And I mean, with Anna Kendrick, oh my God, I can't even imagine giving her a line reading. She would be like, what, what are you doing? Like, it just, just tell me something else. You know, tell me the emotion, tell me the feeling that you're trying to get. Uh, with Tony Collette, she was so amazing. Uh, there was one moment where I gave her a little tweak for just the middle of a scene. Um, but we had shot the whole thing. And then Ryan called me over because he was editing. Um, and he said, hey, Joe, check, check this out. This is pretty cool. And he had uh, like two up, like a, you know, he'd mirrored the video. Uh, and it's, you know, just two videos that are identical playing side by side. I'm like, what do you, what, what is this? He's like, wait, wait, wait. And then just at that moment of the, of the change, she diverts, it becomes like two different videos, you know, she's angrier in one and happier in the other. And then whoop, right back to normal. And she's like a robot. I'm certain that Tony Collette is an acting robot. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so that's the kind of thing you have to realize, especially when you're working with multiple actors, that person's best on their first take, that person needs to warm up for 10 takes. We're gonna shoot their close-ups first. And then that person, that person's getting ready, getting warmed up. Okay, they're ready. Like, go ahead and shoot the other side, and then we'll shoot the two shot. Or let's start with the two shot because they both suck, uh, and then eventually we'll we'll come back in for the close ups later. Yeah. So something I, I think is uh, is pretty critical, regardless of whether you're a director, editor, writer, um, any of it. Every everybody that we've ever worked with, and Joe and I figured this out in pitching as well. Um, Everybody just wants to know that they're in they're in good hands. They want to know that they're safe. They want to know that you know what you're doing. Uh, so confidence is critical, even if you're faking it. Like you have to, you have to project an energy like you know what you're talking about. You know what you want, and that doesn't mean that you're not willing to hear feedback and uh, and, and to have your heads of department participating. Joe's. An, an amazingly collaborative director. Uh, and and you, you have to be able to filter out, like a director is just a filter for good ideas too, you know? And you have to be able to um, filter those ideas out and you have to be able to present, uh, whether you're directing, whether you're walking into a room and you're trying to pitch a TV show or a pilot, uh, you're trying to pitch an ad for uh, a, a take on an ad for a, a, you know, a car commercial or something, it doesn't matter. Everybody just wants to feel like they're not going to lose their job because they hired you. You know, that's that at the end of the day, that kind of uh, that kind of is what's driving everybody's decision making. Because if they if they could do it, they, they would do it. If the person that's making that signing the check could could just direct it themselves. You're not looking for their their approval. You're looking to tell them, hey, I got this, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's pretty pretty universal across the board for everybody, regardless of what department you're in. And also knowing when to say things like, I don't know, uh, you know, somebody asks you something, uh, it's like, what, what do you think? Uh, what do you think that's going to cost? Or, or how long do you think this is going to take? Or how angry do you think I should get here? Um, it's okay to say like, I don't know, let's see. Let's, let's, start, let's start not very and, and let's see where it goes. Um, you know, or let's start very angry and, and then let's uh, bring it back down. Um, you know, and if you, if you get enough, I don't knows in there, people think that you know more than you do. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you don't know things, you know, like it's, it's, it's counterintuitive, but it works that way.
Well, thank you very much. That's very insightful. Thanks to both of you guys. Thanks. Tanner. Tanner hey, Thomas. guys. Uh, really liked the movie. Just had a question. I've noticed just in this little chat that we've had that you guys have such a great relationship between each other. Um, what do you think has kept you guys working together on multiple projects over the last years? Mm, that's a good one. Mm. Uh, well, Ryan and I met at the, the most exciting uh, possible job uh, for a creative person in the world, which is, uh, it was editing medical DVDs uh, back in Boston, Massachusetts. And it was literally like, um, doctors, like actual doctors, uh, saying these incredibly boring scripts. Uh, the same script every day. <laughs> we, we memorized the entirety of the script and, and we had memorized it so much that we could edit just by waveform, just looking at the waveform of it. It's like, oh, this person flubbed this line here. And cut, 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 cut. Um, but I still dream of um, that script. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, it was under duress. Uh, and then we had a lot of duress with the YouTube channel. Uh, and then it, Ryan is just a duressful person. So I think we've uh, had to stay together. Huh? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 real, the real deal is that we're, we're best friends. Like we, we love uh, working together and, um, and we trust each other. And uh, you don't necessarily have to staff your, your film with all of your best friends, but you're also going to be spending an enormous amount of time with all of these people and you have to be able to at least tolerate each other. Uh, and we communicate so clearly. Uh, feelings don't get hurt uh, when, uh, when Joe and I are, are disagreeing about uh, how a script should go, what, how a scene should play out. Um, I, I, being able to have like a safe environment where you can feel co comfortable saying your idea and I don't think that Joe is going to never want to work with me again if he if he hates it, um, and uh, you know I think I, that's so that's so critical to being able to stay together for a long time. It's actually something I try to carry into the other relationships and friendships that I have in my life. Is it actually kind of messes up your other relationships? In your yeah, <laughs> we're, so, we're so like open and honest with each other. It's like, oh man, that that idea really really sucks. Uh, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, that you sometimes go, um, you know, and it's sometimes not great to tell your wife, oh, that, that dress just looks just not just anything but that one. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be a little bit, a, you know, a little more courteous sometimes. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, you know, filmmaking is a lot of trial and error. Uh, we are writing, um, we're adapting a book right now that we absolutely can tell you nothing about. Um, but uh, it's, it's really hard um, to adapt a book just in general, especially one that's based in reality, but a real person's life. So you're like, how much am, am I gonna lie about this person and how much, and you have different lines. Part of it is the morality and part of it is just like, but you know, we have a, uh, a contract with the audience to give them a great film um, but then also the contract with the, that person um, and also the contract with your producers, literally a contract saying like, you know, this movie has got to make money. Um, so like how much artsiness versus, uh, you know, how much, um, you know, fanciness versus how much like just action and fun are you going to put into a film? Um, when you write a film as bleak as Arctic, you got to find somebody who is you know, down for that. Uh, and, and yeah, Ryan and I just have always stuck to our guns. Uh, and we have a really complimentary um, way of working together. I say nice things about him. He says nice things about me. <laughs> complimentary also. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so yeah, we, yeah, we, we have a skill set that, uh, that works well with each other. And um, that, uh, we, I think we're both just really lucky to, to find each other. I mean, there are, there are definitely lessons to take from, um, from our work relationship and our friend relationship. Uh, but also there's like, you know, it's, it's, it, there's also something that it's like, you can't just, just do that with any other person on the street as long as you follow these rules. Um, there is a, like the, it just happens to be that the makeup of both of our characters uh, work so uh, well with each other. And, and the lesson there is to 
when you find people that you work well with uh, at any level, uh, you, you keep doing it. And I mean, Joe and I were making 24 hour film festival videos together in Boston and then, you know, doing that to YouTube, to short films, to feature films, because, and we stuck together the whole time because it was like when there's a good thing that isn't broken and it just keeps getting better, you know, so many people make the mistake of trying to go after something different or they fight over money or they fight, we just don't care about those things. We just care about how are we gonna make the best movie or commercial or whatever possible. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, it's been a pleasure. I have a bunch more questions, but uh, we'll just have to kind of meet up in LA sometime over coffee or something. And, uh, it's been a really lovely night. Thank you so much for sharing this great movie. Good luck with your release of uh, Stowaway. Really looking forward to it. I just want to ask one, I do want to ask one question because you didn't you didn't finish it. Where did you where did you ultimately film Stowaway and how nice was it to be on a stage for most of the movie? So nice. I, I am never shooting outside ever again. I am only shooting on sets, green screens only. Uh, we shot it in Germany uh, and they had some, you know, they paid for a lot of our films. So they had some pretty strict uh, uh, stipulations for us to shoot there. Um, uh, so the, you know, every name was Icelandic in Arctic. Every name is going to be German in uh, the uh, the Stowaway film that we did. Uh, basically, Ryan and me and the producers and the actors uh, were the only non-Germans on the film crew. Um, there was one weird stipulation that they had that was like, okay, your composer must be a composer that not only is a composer, but is also a musician and must come from this one tiny area of uh, Germany. And we were like, what? Um, that's impossible. That's just, okay, fine. We'll get somebody to do that. But then like, you know, they, they, we fix the music later with like an American composer or someone else, uh, even a, a different German composer. But it turns out that there was one guy who had, who was a pianist, his name was Hauschka, and he was an Academy Award nominated composer who wrote the movie Lion from, that had just moved into that little area. So <laughs> it was just like so fortuitous that we were like, yes. And he could have made so much more money because he, a lot of our, our tax and senses were tied to him getting involved. But anyway, um, that's it. Yeah, and uh, I, I uh, had the luxury of not editing in an ice box, and I was so close to the stage that I was either on the stage, like my computer was literally like next to a rocket ship, and I would be showing Joe the cut as he was as he was shooting, um, or uh, I was directly across the hall, like literally three steps from where they were shooting. And at one point, we could actually, we I actually had enough of the film cut together where I was really feeling the flow of the movie and understanding the relationships of some of the characters. And I said, man, Anna and Daniel are really shining together on screen. Joe, it would be great if we could just write a new scene, like, which is crazy talk on a feature film set. I was like, I, I would love one more scene with these two uh, just to kind of get a little bit more friendship and background between these two characters. And, um, you know, Joe said, go for it, write up, write up a draft, I'm shooting, and then we'll, you know, we'll see what you think, what we think. And I literally, I wrote the scene, sent it to Joe, he hit print, gave it to Daniel and Anna, the crew shot it, and it was in the movie by breakfast the next morning. Wow. Um, and it's still there on Netflix on the 22nd. So, like, you know, we, we had the opportunity to, to capture and create a little bit more magic. Um, oh. It is such a it is such a unique thing to have uh, the team is unique, you know, writer director, but also editor, and um, and I, I know I said we're not asking any other questions, but have there been these moments, maybe to Joe, where people were saying, "Hey, Arctic was great, let's get you on something," but you know, we're gonna we're gonna make you work with this famous editor. Has there mm -hmm. been any of that, or do people recognize that part of the magic is the uh, is the team? I mean, that happened on Arctic. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we, uh, we we can get into this way later, but uh, 
uh, over copy. Legally, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say, but they we were very much tried. They, someone tried to kick us out of of Arctic. Uh, both both of us. Hmm. Uh, um, but yeah, it, it, it you know our cut was undeniably better than what everyone else was working on. Uh, so yeah, it's it's just a matter of um, pushing for the people that you want and, and things like that. And um, yeah, same thing happened with the uh, stowaway where uh, you know once we had Arctic proven and it's like we're we're a team, guys. Sorry, people have this misconception that an editor must be somebody in the basement that knows nothing about it that like has never seen any other movie ever. And it's like, here you go, this is virgin footage, uh, good luck. And, and they know nothing. It's like, it, it, that's the only way to be impartial. But Ryan and I, you know, he, he was there on set when we were trying to get this shot that took us two hours because there's the wind. And it didn't, he didn't even put it into the, I was kind of offended. He didn't even put it into the, the cut to begin with. I was like, at least put it into the cut, man. He's like, it's, it's not gonna make the final cut, so I'm not, I'm not gonna bother. And I'm like, okay, you're right, but you're gonna an asshole about it. Uh, so yeah, you know, that's that, plus like a bunch of money and a bunch of time, which was 30 days for, for Stowe, not a lot of bunch of money, that made something really exciting, you know, where we had these huge walls that were video walls that were like 50 foot wide with, uh, the stars and, and they were so dizzying and like you know Anna Kendrick who's 100 pounds soaking wet wearing an 140 pound suit like it, it was just a lot of stuff that we needed to deal with in the next movie but we'll do this again uh, next time around but about stowaway. That'd be want. awesome. That would be awesome. I'm sure everyone would welcome that. Guys mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thanks for the time. Have a great night and good luck on the release. Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, I, once these guys drop out, I just want to make one last announcement to people here. Um, we'll see you guys, Joe and Ryan, thank you. Um, I am also going to stop recording just a real quick.